Okay, welcome to the second seed lecture of uh, 2016. Uh, we have Dr. Asiyanbi. Asiyanbi. It's as bad as my name. I'm Dr. Pierre Lejnieska, uh, and I work at the School of Law um, on climate change law. My background is in forests and international law, so I'm extremely interested in the talk for today. The talk is looking particularly at the establishment of new markets, frontier markets, we might call them in terms of nature, within a sort of neoliberal construct. And it's particularly exciting to have a talk about Nigeria. Uh, I've covered this subject for many years, and there's very little written about forests and Nigeria, more generally. And to have one specifically on red class new markets, neoliberalism, is going to certainly add to the developing literature in this field and the critical perspective that um, is going to be given here. So I'd like to welcome you uh, and give my cup. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Fedya. Um, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Lee Adini Ashiyomi, as Fed just mentioned. So today I'll be talking about um, Red Plus, um, framing Red Plus within uh, market environmentalism or the idea of neoliberal na nature. So I'm um, looking at what kind of neoliberal projects Red Plus represents. And um, so I'll be, my, the talk will be uh, mainly divided into two major sections. The first one will be fairly theoretical, and I'll try to keep that short. And uh, then before going to uh, the empirics, the, the case study uh, in Nigeria, and um, some of the things we can learn from that about how neoliberal uh, environmentalism works, or neoliberal nature, neoliberal conservation. Yeah, so uh, I'll be speaking for about one hour, one hour, uh, uh, 10 minutes, there about. Uh, Fedor, please, when it's 30 minutes, do let me know so I can um, get my pace. Yeah, so this talk uh, has been drawn from my PhD research, which I concluded um, earlier this year. Um, and it's also um, a paper I'm working on. Um, it's actually under review with one of the uh, critical environmental journals, but I thought it would be good to, to get um, perspectives from, from you all to share these ideas with you and, and get what you think about um, the sort of ideas. So uh, the paper I started, the, the, the same I started markets in the making, in neoliberal natures, sending red floors in Nigeria's last spring forest. And the picture there is indicative of what um, red floss is all about on one hand. So developed countries, uh, paying developing countries to keep their forests in order to mitigate climate change, so a form of green development. But also uh, sort of exemplifies what payment for ecosystem services is. So uh, uh, the idea that you um, uh, environmental users of environmental services pay providers of environmental services to provide those services. Uh, basically. So I'll elaborate on some of these terms as we go by. So very quickly, the outline for today's talk, uh, we first uh, reflect on what neoliberal natures are and some of the recent trends in literature in this area uh, in order to highlight what I think um, a major challenge is uh, in this literature. And then I'll talk about the idea of markets in the making um, as an extension of neoliberalization. Neoliberalization, specifically looking at neoliberalization as, as a process, as opposed to as a destination or as an end point. Then I'll bring in the ideas from Mitchell Foucault uh, and ideas around neoliberal organizing actions to help us understand some of the um, challenges that I'll raise very soon. I'll then go on to um, introduce Red Plus, give a bit more introduction for those who are relatively new to the idea of Red Plus, and then go deep into the case study in Nigeria, and then try to draw some conclusions from that. So depending on where you are um, during the, pro the period when I did my PhD research in Nigeria, depending on where you are and who you are, you are likely to find yourself among expert um, consultants working to sort of render the forests visible as carbon. So consultants trying to estimate how much of carbon you have in the country, 
or you're likely to find yourself among NGOs and again consultants um, in meetings of this kind where deliberations around what constitutes carbon, how much carbon does Nigeria have, this sort of meetings that sort of uh, generate knowledge and authorize certain kinds of knowledge about the forest and about carbon. Or you're likely to find yourself in this kind of uh, meetings, meetings with communities, where communities are assembled, are uh, uh, told about red plus, they are told about carbon forestry, they are given promises of what to expect in under carbon forestry. They are also given all sorts of tips. Uh, you can say create of uh, soft drink, then make a coca cola or you can find yourself in a place like this. Um, this is a mobile court, a mobile forestry court, and you can see an accused person being tried under a very small canopy with the, with the judge sitting right there. Or you can find yourself in this kind of scenario where local people have been unpicked, arrested for illegal logging or an alleged illegal logging. Or you can find yourself in companies of um, uh, foreign conservation uh, actors who are championing Red Plus, but also championing forest protection alongside, so with, with all kinds of weapons. There's, there's a gun uh, lying there. Or you can find yourself in a company like this, with the governor of Cross River State, the state in which Red Plus is going on in Nigeria, in the company of Arnold Schwarzenegger, former governor of California, talking about Red Plus, green development, talking about uh, carbon forestry. Or you can find yourself among critical NGOs who are campaigning seriously against Red Plus, campaigning against uh, the whole idea of commodifying the forests um, and uh, the threats that that portends for communities. Or again, you can find yourself among NGOs again taking over the roles of the state, of state actors uh, representing the state at all kinds of meetings and events. Or you can find yourself in the company of military men who have been drafted um, uh, to, to sort of police the forest for Red Plus. So depending on where you are and who you are, you can find yourself in any of these circumstances, any of those, you find yourself in any of these companies. So the question then arises, with this sort of heterogeneous uh, uh, element, you can see all kinds of, all kinds of um, meetings, all kinds of gatherings from military intervention to meeting in California, to meetings of NGOs, to to meetings with communities, you could see uh, the states uh, uh, imposing uh, um, uh, force on, 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 the, on the forest landscape. So with this heterogeneous element, the question then arises whether a project like Red Plus is actually neoliberal, whether it's actually seeing the states being ruled back, as it's expected under a typical neoliberal project, whether you, we're actually seeing uh, uh, the market principle being prioritized, I mean, you also want to ask the question, is a commodity regime really emerging in a project of that nature? So uh, are we seeing uh, um, uh, trade in, 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 in carbon credits, for instance, or carbon offsets? But are we also seeing incentives in this sort of projects that sort of deploy force to, 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 um, to render the forest available as carbon? So that's the, that's the sort of questions that, that I will try to, to um, ask and try to also provide answers to this evening. And these sort of questions are important, not just for RED, they are important because it's precisely the sort of complexities I showed you earlier that, that uh, scholars in this area are pointing to when they consider neoliberal projects on the ground. So our neoliberal projects have been pursued on the ground. They also point to all kinds of complexities, difficulties, the, the very idea that these projects do not only deploy uh, market elements, they also deploy elements that are totally against the, the idea of market environmentalism. So they deploy force uh, and sometimes rather than provide incentives to, to communities for them to give off um, action on the forest and then embrace conservation as it were, this project deploy force sometimes. Sometimes they deploy subsidies rather than incentives. Subsidies comes from the state rather than subsidy, uh, rather than incentives that come from the market, for instance. But they also point to the fact that the implementation of these sort of projects are very minimal, very thin on the ground, so that while there's a lot of noise um, in the policy circle, actually what's actually happening on the ground is very thin. Um, and in fact, in some cases, this project has stolen, so they are reaching a dead end um, that, that um, um, scholars are beginning to point out the sense in which some of these projects may not be neoliberal. Some of them are asking, are this project actually neoliberal? And um, 
a very typical, um, a very exemplar um, example of, of neoliberal nature of project is Premium for Ecosystem Services, which is like the umbrella project for the kind of um, schemes that get environmental services provider in, in contact with environmental services user for them to have a voluntary exchange, basically. So you have all kinds of projects under this, from forest projects, kind of carbon forestry projects, to biodiversity offset projects, to wetland projects. Uh, so basically getting local communities, for instance, or <coughs> groups together to provide, to sort of secure environmental services, which is then made available to, to users of these services. So scholars of payment for ecosystem services are essentially pointing to precisely the same sort of complexities. What is expected of uh, a typical PES scheme, payment for ecosystem services scheme, is a voluntary um, association between a well-defined uh, buyer and a, and a pro provider or producer of environmental services, negotiating over a well-defined environmental service uh, that must be provided, that must be secured on the ground. But in actuality, uh, what people see on the ground when they sort of examine these projects and the ways that they are carried on on the ground are uh, uh, situations where rather than having a voluntary market exchange between two parties, you're having the states taking charge of this project, providing the subsidy rather than allowing incentives between um, different, um, the, the, the different parties, the, the two parties, the provider and the, and the users of these of this services. So they also point to all kinds of complexities and challenges to those projects on the ground. The fact that they, they are struggling to, to actually achieve the market ideals that you would expect from projects like this. So in fact, some conclude that most PES experiment schemes have little to do with the market. And um, some also conclude that ecos uh, payment for ecosystem services schemes cannot be described as neoliberal. So that's what some of the, some of the hotels in this area have, have come to conclude, uh, looking at how these projects actually um, are playing out on the ground. So looking at those complexities again, I mean, some of the responses that come from literature uh, is that, okay, given these complexities around uh, whether or not these projects are market projects, let's go back to the very idea of what the market is. What are market projects? What are market-like projects? What are market-based projects? So there's a, there's a call for more, more specification or more um, distinction around those various terms that people have deployed in, in, in um, explaining what's actually going on on the ground. So the idea is if we can get some of these terms very clearly, maybe they give us a very clear sense of what's actually going on on the ground, whether they are actually uh, market instruments or economic instruments, for instance, or just market-like instruments, all kinds of um, distinctions coming up. So another response is um, uh, the sense that um, scholars are also calling for all kinds of typologies and the framing of markets as degrees. So market as a continuum rather than as, um, as one single destination or as one major objective. So. So having markets um, described in terms of continuum. But some, some, also are, some, some, some scholars in this area are also pointing to the fact that if indeed uh, ecosystem services projects do not have the market elements that people expect them to have, then could we then suggest that they are not fostering the kind of capital accumulation uh, uh, ideas that, that uh, critical scholars are hoping against? So that can we then um, sort of appropriate the schemes in more progressive ways uh, in, in trying to sort of actually address environmental problems rather than frame them as a uh, project for capitalist accumulation. So uh, these are responses from PES scholars, more, uh, more specifically. So PES scholars are scholars who focus on PES schemes, which is a very narrow um, aspect of neoliberal nature. But today are scholars of neoliberal nature who have also been grappling with this complexities for a while. Uh, so um, um, about the close of the last, last uh, decade, for instance, you have many of the scholars coming up to sort of also grapple with the same complexities, but so they, they tend to suggest that what we need to do is basically qualify neoliberalism. So qualify what neoliberal projects are. So you have ideas around hybrid neoliberalism or variegated neoliberalism or rollout neoliberalism. So rollout neoliberalism in particular, um, 
roll up neoliberalism in particular is supposed to be the opposite of roll back neoliberalism. So neoliberalism is expected to uh, roll back the state, roll back the influence of the state. But since what what has been observed on the ground is actually the growing um, um, interest of the state in this sort of project. So people are trying to suggest that could we be experiencing a form of roll out neoliberalism as opposed to roll back neoliberalism that uh, people have always, have always expected of market schemes of this nature. So, but more recently, in fact, earlier in this year, uh, Bosch and Fletcher, who are major scholars in, in neoliberal nature, uh, also came up with this idea of multidimensional neoliberalism to sort of help us qualify uh, neoliberalism to take account of the complexities of, of projects that we're observing on the ground. So, so one of the major conclusions that uh, scholars in these areas have always come back to uh, is this idea that regardless of how these projects play out on the ground, regardless of the fact that they are incomplete, discontinuous, hybridized, differentiated, complex, whatever the, the, um, the evidence is on the ground, all this evidence do not suggest that these projects are actually not neoliberal. So, so, and the reason they have said this, I'll come to in a second. So, the reason is precisely this. If you look at uh, Noel Castri, another major scholar in this area, um, has come up with this three, uh, three uh, dimensions of neoliberal nature, neoliberal projects, which I think is very, very crucial. So, he talks of neoliberalism or neoliberal nature, first in terms of an overarching philosophy. So if you think of the philosophy propounded by the, the earliest uh, propounders of neoliberalism, people like von Mises Hayek, uh, Walter Hurricane, Ronald Coles, for those who are familiar with these people, uh, then the Chicago School, which has been um, at the forefront of neoliberal projects in the world, say from 1960s onward, and uh, the sort of framing of neoliberalism that people like um, um, David Harvey, Neil Smith, and um, O'Connor and Mitchell Foucault, the, the framing of neoliberalism that they critique, they, these people critique this overarching philosophy. So we can, we can then begin to see how, on one hand, neoliberalism is an overarching philosophy, but beneath that philosophy, you then have all kinds of general policy programs. So you can have neoliberalization of nature, for instance, which is different from neoliberalization of education or neoliberalization of healthcare or neoliberalization of of, uh, of other dimensions, other, other aspects of social life, which is a, a level below the overarching philosophy. And then from these general policies, you then have more specific policies, more specific projects, for instance, the payment for ecosystem services or red plus, which are very specific projects under the new liberalization of nature. So the, 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 the question here is that scholars of payment for ecosystem services who earlier concluded that PES schemes are non-neoliberal have limited their analysis to this level. So if you limit analysis to this level, just looking at how these projects are going on on the ground and then trying to decide whether these projects are neoliberal or not, you're likely to run into the same problem where people suggest, oh, because we are not seeing the states being rolled back, then it's not neoliberalism. If, if we are not seeing uh, markets being formed explicitly or exchange going on among different actors, then it's not neoliberal nature, it's not neoliberal conservation. But and, um, uh, people like bon, um, Brambosha and, and, and Fletcher, or Fletcher are arguing that in order to be able to gauge whether this project are truly neoliberal, we need to go a step higher and consider where they emerge from, the very high of neoliberalism of nature, where many of these projects came from, and they even go even higher and consider the overarching philosophy within which this project, uh, this project are framed. Yeah, so, so the question is then not limiting analysis to this specific level, but taking it higher um, uh, to, to understand the, the general political economy, the overarching framework, the overarching philosophy within which projects like this are framed. So while this sort of explanation helps to address what I consider some of the impress in whether projects like this are neoliberal or not, I also feel there is an aspect that is, le that is less explored, and that's the, the, the sense in which neoliberal projects are also processes. So they, they, they are processes and they can be understood as processes, just processes. Processes that do not necessarily take uh, the outcomes for granted. So 
you don't take the, the art form of these processes for granted. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain that further in a second. Um, but just to mention that the idea that neoliberalization, neoliberalization is a process is not entirely new. I mean, um, scholars, especially who take the Marxian approach, post-care economy approach to neoliberal nature, have always mentioned that neoliberalization is a process. But what they have not gone so far to do is to actually elaborate what, what, how, how we can get to understand this process. So how do we talk about it in a way that does not take it for granted that these processes will eventually emerge into markets? Yeah. So, uh, so the problem with, for instance, taking these processes as continuum, uh, like the PS scholars are doing, is that even within the process, scholars want to see commodification going on. They want to see market elements in the process. But I suggest that the process of bringing about markets are more complex, that you're likely not to see even elements of commodification in those processes. And um, I represent that with a very simple diagram. This is a very, very, very simple, very simplistic diagram just to capture what I'm trying to explain here. So, so far, what we've always seen is everyone agreeing, okay, many of these projects have neoliberal vision, but between their vision to reality, to the, to the point where they become markets, how do we talk about this process in between without taking for granted that they will, they will end, ultimately end up becoming markets? So, so, so if, you, if you look at the second diagram, for instance, you have the same, starting from the same vision, but then thinking differently about what this process between vision and result uh, is. So you, you're not likely to see, you, you probably won't see market elements, for instance, at the beginning, at the point where neoliberal vision is being implemented on the ground. So how do you talk about, for instance, this, this red aspect, without mentioning the words commodification or markets, which are actually not happening on the ground at the moment. So this, this, is the, this is the problematic that I decided to uh, focus on uh, in my work. How do you talk about this process without taking for granted the fact that they always end up in markets? So how do you talk about it without uh, this blunt categorization of markets, non-markets, neoliberal, non-neoliberal, uh, market failure, market success? How do you talk about this process? Because the problem with not grappling with, with this process uh, on its own as a, as a durable and, and a stable analytical category. The problem with that is that once people go on the ground to look at projects like Red Plus and they can't find market, then they say, oh, it's a market failure. And the implication of that is very often people neglect the whole range of uh, implications for, of this project on the ground. So the effect that this project are having on the ground and the specific ways in which they are being implemented on the ground. So whether they, they finally become markets or not, Let's talk about the process through which the market is being built. And my argument is that Red Plus, in particular, is, is uh, an archetype of neoliberalization as a process. Because uh, Red Plus is meant to sort of prepare developing countries to help them develop um, carbon commodity regimes that will later be traded on international markets. But most of, most of this project are still in the very early phases where uh, what's, much of what's going on is preparing institutions, changing laws, changing policies, uh, intervening in communities, getting communities to understand what all these things are all about. So these are, these are the phases that they call readiness phase, and it's a standard phase in Red Plus. So Red Plus is a process that is meant to eroad markets. So understanding Red Plus as a process um, is very, very crucial. So um, on one hand, so understanding Red Plus as a process is crucial on one hand, but if you, if you talk to other scholars and tell them Red Plus is neoliberal, they tell you it's not, precisely because you don't see exchange of carbon credits already in Red Plus. You don't see a lot of incentives going on on the ground. So my argument is that despite uh, the fact that we're not seeing all of these things happening on the ground, exchange of commodity regime or, or um, large incentives or, or uh, actual commodification going on on the ground, Red Plus is still neoliberal for the same reasons that I explained earlier because you need to look at the origin of projects of this nature, projects that frame the environment in terms of services that can be traded. So that's where Red Plus itself came from. It came from a very neoliberal provenance. So and um, many of the elements of Red Plus, at least in its vision, so the vision of Red Plus are thoroughly neoliberal. 
Part of vision is to incentivize developing countries to keep their forests, incentivize communities to also keep the forest. And of course, the, the ultimate aim, what I call the terms of Red Plus, is the market exchange. So in terms of its declared intention, its declared aim, it's, it's clearly neoliberal. So but how do you understand the new neoliberal project of this nature? So I suggest we understand it as a process. Yeah? So, and because of the, the, the lack of uh, vocabulary of talking about or elaborating neoliberalization as a process, because of lack of vocabulary, especially in the magazine literature and the political economy literature, I found uh, very useful elements in, in Foucault's elaboration of, of neoliberalism to, to grapple with this, with this uh, idea of um, neoliberalization as, as a process. So, Foucault, for instance, um, talks about neoliberalism as different from liberalism, classical liberalism, uh, which, which is a precursor of neoliberalism. So for, for neoliberalism, for liberalism, the, the, um, the parents of, or the progenitor of um, neoliberalism, the propounders or the proponents of liberalism would suggest that um, the market is naturally existing. So that if you leave people in society, naturally, they will begin to exchange commodities among themselves out of particular need that they consider to be natural. So that's, that's, that's how uh, classical liberalists or, or proponents of classical liberalism considered uh, the market or considered what liberalism is. But neoliberalism, that is the ideas of the markets coming from the 1940s, 1950s, through people like um, von Hayek, Macy's, uh, the sort of people that I listed earlier. Their own notion of liberalism do doesn't take for granted that markets is naturally existing. So for them, they believe very strongly that the market has to be constructed. Yeah? The market cannot emerge on its own. It has to be constructed. So, and Foucault sort of emphasized this very clearly in his analysis of neoliberalism. And he identified two categories of actions in constructing the market. So he identified the regulatory actions, but also organizing actions. So regulatory actions are actions that are directed at maintaining already existing markets. Whereas organizing actions are, are actions that are directed at producing markets where markets never existed. So these sort of actions are actions that, that um, take account of the fact that markets are never always existing at every level of society. Take, for instance, carbon markets uh, were not there uh, 20, 30 years ago. There was nothing like carbon markets. So the process that brought carbon ma markets into being have to have been some form of organizing action. So these are actions that are not just economic. They do not just address uh, the economic domain. But these are actions that address all kinds of domains, social domains more generally. So in order to bring about um, markets, in order to produce or construct markets. So I don't say the theoretical, um, but I'll go into the, the empirical elaboration of these ideas uh, very soon. But just to emphasize the sense in which um, uh, neoliberal organizing actions capture uh, the sort of actions that is needed to get neoliberalization through the process of becoming. So the process I emphasized earlier, the sense in which a project like Red Plus is a process. So those processes are being driven by what Foucault calls organizing actions. So these are actions that sort of intervene on, on scientific details, on legal details, on geographies, intervene on communities, on all kinds of um, domains, as long as those domains are required to bring about a uh, market regime. So if you if you bring if you bring um, the idea of organizing action back into the diagram that I showed earlier, you begin to see that we have a vocabulary, but also a very detailed conceptualization of of markets of uh, markets as process, yeah, um, organizing action, helping us frame markets as processes. So for Co then take this forward by suggesting that organizing actions as long as they intervene in all kinds of social domains that are necessary to bring about the market. They, can, they are best understood as apparatus. So apparatus are just collection of all kinds of elements, practices, and knowledges that are held together uh, in order to bring about, bring about markets. So for those who are familiar with ideas around apparatus, but also assemblage, uh, uh, people like Derrida, Jacques Derrida, and all of these other post-structuralist um, thinkers, have used ideas around the apparatus and assemblage to understand 
how um, projects um, are carried on on the ground. So now to, to red plots uh, in particular, uh, I've only dealt with those theoretical details which um, some of you probably found boring. So a uh, very uh, brief background on red plots. Red plots is reducing emission from deforestation and forest degradation. Um, it was proposed in 2005 at the Conference of Parties to, to Kyoto Protocol. Um, and compared to com uh, clean development mechanisms, which are also projects under the Kyoto Protocol, Red Plus is a nationally framed project. So these are projects that are pursued through countries, unlike CDM that could be pursued, say, at community level or through individuals or organizations or companies. So and Red Plus focuses on tropical countries, so you're not likely to find these projects on, in um, temperate countries. So and uh, the project is led by the UN, UNFCC, that the, the UN framework for framework convention on, on climate change. It's led by the UNFCC, but there are all kinds of platforms for implementing the project. So you have the World Bank, which has its own platform for implementing Red Plus. You have the UN itself, which has the UN Red platform for implementing it. But you also have all kinds of bilateral and multilateral agreements within between developing and developed countries to implement Red Plus. And um, so there are, we have more than 2,000 of this sort of projects ongoing in different parts of the world, from Asia to Africa to Latin America. Um, so the, 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 the aim of Red Plus is very clear. Um, the first is to reduce carbon emissions very cheaply by sort of offsetting emissions in developed countries by uh, true forest uh, sequestration of carbon in developing countries. But this project also promises what they call core benefits. Those, so those are benefits beyond just carbon mitigation. Benefits that include um, fostering uh, uh, better livelihoods for local communities, but also conserving biodiversity, um, improving forest governance, and uh, also the very general idea of protecting, conserving uh, forests. So those are sort of core benefits that Red Plus promises. So, and um, funding for Red Plus comes through, at these early stages, much of the funding comes through grants. So, grants from developed countries to developing countries. But the aim is that those grants will prepare uh, 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 developing countries to, to begin to generate carbon credits that can then be sold in international markets. So that ultimately the aim is to shift it into uh, the market region. So, it's also part of uh, what scholars have framed as the green economy or yeah, so Red Plus in Nigeria. This is a map of Nigeria for those who are not quite familiar with, with the country. Um, so groundwork to implement Red Plus began in 2008, um, but formal implementation of projects began in 2014. And uh, Nigeria's project, uh, Nigeria's Red Plus, is being supported by the World Bank, um, World Bank's platform for, for Red Plus, which is the Forest and Carbon Partnership Facility. It's also been supported by the UN platform, which is the UN Red, and then uh, the California-based Governors Climate Forum. So these are the platform that sort of provide the funding, the finance, but also technical expertise for Nigeria. And Nigeria's project just came out from the readiness phase, which I explained earlier, the idea that um, those projects are meant to prepare, uh, prepare the ground for market exchange. And then it's been piloted in one of the 36 states in Nigeria. So which is Cross River, which is this uh, very small uh, uh, area here. Uh, Cross River is, anyway, relative to, to certain countries. It can be a country of its own. It's the size of Israel or Slovenia. So this is a map of Cross River where the project is going on. So it's a national project. It's been piloted in Cross River. And then in Cross River, it's been piloted in specific community areas. So community clusters around here, three cluster areas. So these are the pilot areas for Red Force in Nigeria. Just to mention that this forest is part of a, a major biodiversity hotspot, uh, the Guinea Forest Biodiversity Hotspot. And it also, it is claimed that this forest has more than 50% of what is left of Nigeria's tropical rainforest. So the area is very, very important to conservationists. There are a whole range of conservation projects that have been going on in this area for several decades. So I, conduct, I conducted field work uh, to gather data on this project uh, between 2013 and 2014. And um, 
I gathered data through all kinds of means, um, uh, in-depth interviews, for instance. I went about observing people in their everyday activities, observed uh, bureaucrats and, and state institutions, observed uh, implementers of that laws, but also communities, and also looked at archival documents. And so the, the major um, frame of analysis is Foucault and discourse analysis. Um, so now to results, to, to the results of, of this case. So again, going back to, to the idea of um, organizing action as apparatus. So red plus as an apparatus is being carried out through what I regard as six major regimes of practices, uh, and it, which are linked to the general idea of creating a carbon market. Yeah. So this is what you have in a typical organizing organizing action. Organizing action are always a disparate combination of different things, but those different things are categorized under these different um, categories. These categories emerged first from Foucauldian uh, ideas of governmentality on one hand, but also uh, literature on, on assemblage and apparatus, and then combining those two ideas with what I actually saw happening on the ground, um, what, what I, what's actually going on on the ground as far as Red Plus is concerned. So I'll start and go through each of these very quickly. So plebematization, so it's very central to ideas to create a regime of market. It's always the idea that certain aspect of reality will be problematized, so framed as, pro as problems in need of, of, of um, solutions or improvements. So in the case of Nigeria's Red Plus, you have these narratives about deforestation crisis in Cross River. You know, I, I earlier indicated how very important Cross River is to Nigeria. So to declare a crisis in a place like that is to uh, sort of call for uh, very serious intervention. So, these are, so by, by framing uh, 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 the crisis in Cross River in terms of a very major uh, uh, catastrophic crisis, proponents of carbon forestry uh, sort of justify why there's a need for a project like Red Plus in Nigeria. So in particular, um, uh, an environment summit was convened in 2008 in which um, uh, proponents of this, of this summit came up with a communique. In this communique, they came up with three major, three major recommendations to the state government. To the state government. The first one is to stop the generation of state revenue from forestry. So historically, the states, Cross River State has generated revenue from, from forestry, from timber exploitation, by granting licenses and all kinds of permits to people to go log, to go convert the forest for timber. So the second, um, second recommendation is to declare a moratorium. So that's a, a ban, a total ban on logging for two years. That was what they recommended at first. The third recommendation was to take action to sort of take advantage of carbon credit market. So at a point, there was, it wasn't called Red Plus. Red Plus is a, is a very re recent iteration of what began as Red, R-E-D, then R-E-D-D, then R-E-D-D Plus. So at the point, all they knew was carbon credit market. So, and that was how the whole idea of starting Red Plus began in Cross River State around 2008. But another dimension of this problematization, uh, different from ecological, that is the framing of, um, of deforestation as a crisis in Cross River, a different dimension is this fiscal problematization. So by just suggesting to the states to stop, to stop, um, to stop revenue generation from the forests. Doesn't make sense to any, any government. I mean, to, to ask the government to stop its own source of revenue. So, but you need to understand this fiscal problematization in order to, to, to grasp why the states agreed to actually stop revenue generation from timber. <coughs> so, Cross River State has also been going through a very serious financial crisis um, since about 2007, and this crisis is due to the fact that it lost some of its crude oil wells to a neighboring state through um, legal litigation. So, and crude oil is the most important source of revenue for, for all government, levels of governments in Nigeria. So it lost those oil wells, which made it uh, uh, um, cash strapped on one hand, but also the state also accumulated huge debt over a number of years. Um, so that in 2009, the governor sat down and began to think of new ways, very very, uh, um, very new and creative ways of generating funds for the state. So 
and they came up with these ideas of fostering foreign direct investment on one hand, but also uh, attracting international donor grants on the other. So when, when the governor was told that a project like Red Plus is, was going to bring huge uh, funds from international donors, the World Bank and the UN, it made very perfect sense to him. So, and the fund that was promised to, to, to the governor, for instance, through carbon funds, was far more than what he could ever realize from timber revenue. So it made sense for him to stop timber revenue uh, and actually impose a ban on, on logging in order for Red Plus to take root. So, this fiscal privatization added to the ecological ones, sort of uh, uh, solidified the need for red plus in Prussia. And this, this is a statement uh, that the uh, state governor kept making in its in his uh, budget speeches, uh, the idea that they expect significant finance from, from red plus uh, on one hand. But just to mention that till the end of the governor's tenure in office in 2015, he kept uh, expecting this fund, but by the end of his tenure, the fund had never come to Nigeria. So he expressed this dissatisfaction, the, um, disappointment at the fact that the, the promises of huge carbon funds never materialized, never materialized. So apart from this problematization, you also have visions, visions of Red Plus, which are basically aims and, and objectives and aspirations of those who propose this project. So on one hand, you have aims of this project as outlined in project documents, which are very clearly defined the aims, aims around mitigating climate change, helping community livelihoods, but also improving forest conservation. But you also have uh, discourses, the ways that proponents, so individuals, cause authors, uh, championing this project, they talk about the, the aim of this project in a very different way. They talk about it in more optimistic, more totalizing, more grandiose ways, in ways that sort of also foster uh, inclusion and participation among different actors. So these are some of the ways in which um, proponents of the, of the projects talk about the aim of a project. So take, for instance, a statement by the regional coordinator for RED, who has been very central to, to the project in Nigeria. The statement sort of suggests that Red Plus has to be a transformational project that cuts across all of government departments, not just forestry departments, but also uh, departments of agriculture, departments of energy. In fact, intervention into the, the, the general way of doing development um, in the state. We also have statements like this one from the state's Red Plus coordinator suggesting that um, Red Plus has something in it for everyone, so everyone have Everyone has something to gain from embracing Red Plus, uh, positioning it as a win-win uh, case for, for all parties. So apart from those visions, you have, you have all the ways of trying to implement these visions in, in reality. And one of, one of those other ways is through institutional reforms. Um, so uh, institutional reforms, this, this, this focuses a lot on uh, changing the law on one hand, changing the laws to make it red, red plus enabling, uh, the way they call it, but also um, putting in place new bureaucrats in the Forestry Commission, in the Forestry Departments, bureaucrats that are able to drive this new vision of red plus. So, uh, and these new bureaucrats are framing their own uh, mandate in terms of switching from timber forestry to carbon forestry, and that has a whole range of implications, uh, including um, authorizing and legitimizing new kinds of knowledge about the forest, but also excluding old ways of seeing the forest. So what actually happened uh, through this institutional reform is a situation in which NGO actors who claim expertise in this sort of projects are taking over the roles of state bureaucrats. So they are taking over new positions in, in the forestry department, and they are beginning to challenge um, uh, the old bureaucrats who focus a lot on timber forestry. So that at the end of the day, uh, you're having very serious tension between, on one hand, NGO-led carbon forestry coalition and the state-led timber forestry uh, coalition. So the sort of quotes from uh, each of these coalitions sort of exemplify the kind of tension that is ongoing between the two coalitions. So up here you have um, uh, a member of this NGO board of the Forestry Commission describing what they met when they were appointed to the Forestry Commission in, in 2009. So they began to see the Forestry Commission as old, as old-fashioned, as um, archaic, as, as rule, unruly. Um, 
so, so that their aim was to, in fact, get rid of most of the foresters from Forestry Commission, recruit new set of people who can easily catch up with the idea of um, carbon forestry or red plus. So but on the other hand, you then have forestry bureaucrats. So for those who have practiced timber forestry for a long time in the Forestry Commission who have been in charge of managing the forest for a long time, uh, saying this sort of statement, the idea that they have been oppressed by NGOs who claim expertise in forest conservation, and that these NGOs know nothing about forestry, but because they claim to know about red plus and uh, the government, the governor is so much in favor of red plus, they use that to oppress um, and hijack their profession, as, as it were. So that's that about institutional reform. You also have elements of um, of elements that are directed at constituting the carbon forest. So these are all kinds of interventions uh, that are meant to render the forest visible as carbon. So you have projects and, uh, and um, exercises that sort of help to frame the forest in this way, in, in very simplistic maps like this. There's a map that has been generated by uh, the UNEP. You have WCMC, this is World Conservation Monitoring Center. I think that's in Cambridge or Oxford. Yeah, so they, they were the consultants to Nigeria uh, in determining, estimating how much carbon is in the soil in Nigeria, how much carbon is in the forest in Nigeria. So a map like this uh, claims to show us how much carbon uh, is in the forest, in fact, throughout the landscape in Nigeria. So what this kind of simplification does is that it takes for granted the fact that, uh, uh, take for instance, this is the Niger, Niger Delta in Nigeria. Niger Delta is where much of the crude oil in Nigeria is. That's where exploration goes on. And you can see it is the same region that has the greatest um, uh, amount of carbon by the shade of, so the darker the shade, the higher the amount of carbon in there. So what this simplification does is that it takes for granted the fact that the, the amount of carbon in the Niger Delta is imminently spent carbon, if you get what I mean. So it's crude oil and it's going to be, be extracted and spent. It's going to be burnt compared to, so it's all carbon that, is, that will be kept in there for a long time. So it takes for granted all these different dynamics, all these different um, kinds of carbon. So carbon in, in trees is different from carbon in the soil, different from carbon in crude oil, for instance. But this map claims to show all this kind of carbon in just one single map like this. And overlaying this carbon map are areas of co-benefit importance, uh, the way they call it. So these are areas of, um, areas of the red points are gorilla range areas, areas where gorilla, gorilla species are endemic. The, the, the yellow points are areas where you can find chimpanzees, and then the gray points are <coughs> important bird, bird areas, so areas where you find important birds. So, so uh, the claim of the consultants who designed this is to suggest that it's areas where all of these different elements overlap the most that should be the focus of red plus. And of course, this is where you find the red, the yellow, the green. And so, and this is the area where, um, where uh, Cross River is. So, so the, the sort of reinforcing the choice of red, red uh, Cross River as a pilot for Nigeria. But what you don't find on a map like this are areas important to communities. <coughs> Since the very idea of co-benefits as community livelihoods uh, at the center of it. But a map of co-benefit doesn't even have anything to suggest areas are important to communities. So part of the activities required for constituting the carbon forest again is rescaling. So as this kind of national maps uh, are, made, are translated to reality on the ground. Um, uh, proponents of this project have to come down from the national scale to, to cross river scale, to, to uh, state scale. But even further, they also have to do a whole range of rescaling efforts in order to, um, to, to make these areas ready, for, and ready and feasible for, for red plots. So one example is this idea of clustering community forests. So in, in one of the proposals, the, the proponents have suggested that if you go by each of the individual community forests uh, to sort of propose red plus, the community forest would be too small to sort of meet the economics of scale that you need to generate sufficient carbon or to in fact attract finance for red plus in Nigeria. So they suggested the idea of clustering of communities, rescaling them, clustering them all. So, and as you cluster forests, cluster communities in this way, you also raise tension within these communities. Because what actually happened on, on the ground is that 
the more communities are told you're going to be joined together with these other communities as a cluster, the more these communities want to mark out their own portion of the forest. So the more they are told, ah, you, you have to now operate as clusters so that we can do red, the more communities want to sort of be sure that the basis for their own benefits uh, is clearly demarcated and clearly, and it's, all this is generating tension uh, in communities. So um, the next element, once this sort of constitution and rescaling um, uh, is taking place, the next element is this idea of protecting the carbon forest. So, um, so you know, I, I talked earlier about the fact that the states um, announced a moratorium, a two-year moratorium um, in 2009. This moratorium has been extended indefinitely. And this was extended indefinitely because uh, the moratorium, the ban on logging, has become a very important way of demonstrating to um, international donors, international partners, that the state was serious about doing red. So it has become a way of demonstrating political will for Red Plus. So the state has decided to maintain the ban indefinitely. So and the, the state also constituted a, a task force for, for enforcing this ban. So the task force is made up of uh, military men, the police, the navy, who also patrol the, the, um, the, the water areas where timber is being transported. So you have all this kind of constitution, constitution of, uh, of the task force going on uh, to protect the forests. But in order to, to make these things look normal, especially the deployment of military men within the state, you have to also criminalize and sort of securitize the forest landscape. And this includes narratives that sort of paints uh, illegal loggers as criminals, as people who are enemies of the state, who threaten the state's projects. Yeah, and um, so uh, you see pictures like this, you see uh, uh, instances like this uh, all around Cross River. There are piles of wood that have been seized from people uh, uh, who, claim, who they claim have been I guess they didn't seem by legally. But you also have police and military men policing the forest in this way, actually going to the forest to, to arrest people. And you have uh, conservationists, uh, this Peter Jenkins, uh, he's been running conservation projects in Cross River for about 25 years. So for him, he has a personal stake in protecting the forest like this. And he is the chairman of the task force that's enforcing, enforcing the ban. So I'll show this project of motorbikes for you to see uh, the kind of uh, extraction that is also being apprehended by the task force. So you would expect to see vans and, and trucks uh, of, of, of timber, and obviously some of these uh, piles of wood have been transported by trucks. But you also have petty loggers, they call them. So individuals who sort of cut tree in their own farm and convert them to timber and then take them to market. These sort of people will transport fuel, fuel uh, um, few pieces of timber on their motorbikes. So, so these sort of people are also being arrested. So people who sort of cut tree even in their own farm um, for livelihood purposes. So and that's why you have those motorbikes there. And you see the irony of this forest protection is that it's not working at all. In fact, uh, deforestation has increased um, over the period that the task force um, was operating. And the, the explanations are very straightforward. One is corruption in the task force itself. So you have elements within the task force who began to strike illegal deals with timber dealers. You also have the fact that many of the activities of the task force is directed at apprehending and, and, and arresting people who are either already cutting timber or who have cut timber and are transporting it. So that in actual fact, cutting still goes on, only that it's been, it's been uh, discouraged a little. So actual cutting goes on, only that the, t the task force go ahead and goes ahead to seize uh, timber that is already been caught. And also the activities of the task force leaves out large agricultural concessions by foreign investors who are also clearing the forest to establish agricultural plantations. So and they had to leave that out because this sort of agricultural concessions and, and investment are part of the uh, strategies of the government. The, the creative funding strategies, uh, foreign direct investments, if you remember, I mentioned that earlier. So they couldn't, so the, the task force couldn't impose its ban on this sort of clearance, uh, which is really, really massive, clearing the forest. And of course, uh, the protection of the forest also has no popular support, because the price of timber has gone up 400%, basically, I mean, sort of quadrupled over the last few years. 
So there is a lot of uh, hostilities against the task force. And of course, people have, been, people have protested. There have been petitions and court cases against the task force, against the government itself in court. And uh, communities are also revoking land. They are donated to the Forestry Commission decades ago because of the oppression of, of, of um, the, the ban on, on um, forest exploitation. And of course, people are also defining this ban, going ahead to fell uh, timber uh, despite the ban. And there have also been attacks on foresters and also on task force themselves. So whenever members of the task force are found around without being hand, without military men, uh, young people sometimes attack them um, in response for what they are also doing, um, harassing people. That. So finally, uh, this sort of elements, the different elements I've highlighted um, so far, um, uh, problematization, vision, uh, reforming institutions, um, 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 constituting the carbon forest, and also protecting the ca carbon forest, all those different elements. Yeah. All those different elements, as you have seen, uh, are sort of permeated by all kinds of contradiction and tension that you would expect that this sort of project shouldn't last a few months because of the complex violence and, and attacks and, and law uh, court, uh, court cases and all that. But interestingly, projects like this go on for, for years, and that's the case in, in, in Nigeria. So for this project not to fall apart, for them to continue to go on in this way, there is this last strategy that proponents always deploy, which is to stabilize ways of stabilizing those projects. So stabilization is, is the last dimension of it. And how do they stabilize this sort of project? First is by reinforcing uh, um, optimistic narratives, so reiterating promises, the fact that huge funds is still, is still coming through, through carbon finance. Uh, if people would only wait a little more and wait a little more, uh, community people, but also the state. So another way to which stabilization is achieved is uh, maintaining minimal implementation, so not carrying this project so far. Uh, limiting implementation to just reports and workshops and just meetings, so that very, very little is going on on the ground. Huh? Very little is going on on the ground. And I, earlier I demonstrated the, the sense in which you often have pilots within pilots within pilots. So from a national project, you have a pilot in Cross River. Then in Cross River, you have pilot communities. Within those pilot communities, only like two or three communities are actually being engaged on a regular basis on red floods. So by limiting the implementation in those ways, in very um, um, minute, minute ways, um, proponents of this project sort of go beyond contradictions. They go beyond the possibility of um, the project falling apart. But the most important way to which they sort of maintain stability or stabilization, I call it, is by producing subjects. So ensuring that there are people who are buying into this project. So for instance, um, communities are very key here. So producing model, uh, red plus models in communities. And they have tried to achieve this through states directed payments um, of incentives. So prior to this regime, the ban on, on timber, timber regime, uh, communities had always received royalty. So timber royalty. But since, there was a, since they imposed the ban on forest exploitation, the, the state governments turn the royalty into what they call carbon loyalty. So carbon loyalty is then paid to communities, not on the basis of how much forest they have, not which was the basis on which royalties were paid. But these were paid on the basis of your cooperation with Red Plus, your cooperation with the state. So they will identify communities that are cooperating with the state and then pay them what they call carbon loyalty. So this sort of, this sort of strategies help them to sort of continue to get people, communities, and people within the states who are interested in red and who want to see it continue. Yeah? So that is about it. Uh, so you then have communities coming up with this sort of state states uh, saying how they support red and their expectations from red. But you also have some, of, some members of the same community who are a little bit critical, who see things in a very different way. Um, so you always have a mixture of this. But in communities where you have um, uh, most of the people or the leaders supporting Red Plus, then you, you are likely to have a community um, among the, the, the Red Plus models, as it were. So that's basically its then conclusions. Uh, so is Red Plus neoliberal? It is neoliberal for a whole range of reasons that I highlighted. 
and uh, to understand its neoliberal nature is to consider it as a form of markets in the making. So it's, you won't, if, you, if you check Red Plus, you won't see people exchanging carbon commodities, but you would see processes in place to sort of um, bring about markets, bring about this commodity exchange. Uh, so, so understanding markets in the making for grand ideas around organizing action, new organizing action, uh, uh, actions that, that are directed at implementing red are essentially organizing actions. And what's also important is this idea that the market outcome is not guaranteed. And that's why we need to sort of analyze these processes as processes. We can't wait until until we see the market before we can declare them neoliberal or not neoliberal because the market outcome is not even guaranteed. It's not guaranteed that Red Cross will emerge into the community regime of this kind. So I haven't mentioned that then what's needed is to pay attention to all kinds of effects, the, the sort of effects that this sort of projects do have on the ground, uh, effects on institutions and communities, but also on the forest itself. And in this case, I've shown that the effects on institutions is, is not helpful. I mean, you have pensions within the Forestry Commission. On communities, you have communities being denied access to the forest, being harassed. But also on the forest, you have deforestation increasing because of this sort of interventions, which are, in fact, counterproductive by, because of the strategies that they adopt. So uh, that's where I stop. Thank you very much for listening. Framework Convention on Climate Change back in 2005, as you said. I found the paper very interesting in terms of <coughs> detailing the theoretical background behind the, the process of markets. That this is a process, it is not a process which is uh, going to end up as an idealized goal but that goal is part of the communication and the logic which is invested in and used by different actors to achieve different objectives in different locations. And what's very interesting about uh, Nigeria is the context. You, know, you have the desire for not only preserving, say, guerrilla sanctuaries, um, and ensuring that you're getting um, uh, community-based forestry successfully operating, but you have the conflict as well between the, the state-level extraction and the, the economics of that with the extraction for carbon. So this is this transition to a new green economy. In a particular context, I think in the, one of the final uh, quotes, somebody mentioned colonialism. Uh, and a, a key part of the critique around the processes of transformation is the context of colonialism in each country and, and the effect that that had on each community. So th this is an important part of the critique because some people are very clear that this is a a reconfiguration of colonialism, a new appropriation, a new frontier in terms of the greed market uh, at, at multiple levels. And as you say, it, it, it doesn't end up with any red plus emission reduction credits as yet after the process of 10 years. Uh, and the, la the language is, it will be coming. And then that, that happens, that's going on at the international level. It's going on in every 
forests in Asia, in Latin America, and, and in Africa. So, sadly, this is not an issue that's going away. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I'd like to invite everybody uh, is to direct your questions um, and discussion points um, to the A, and let's have a fruitful discussion. Yes. Yes, please. Yes, sorry. I also wanted to refer back to that last quote. I haven't got a chance to read all of it. Um, yeah, and 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 you know, also I'm interested in the subject of how neoliberal natures um, is a neo-colonial project as well. So I don't know if you have something from your research that um, could speak to that. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, like I said, there's these um, this one major chapter in my thesis. So I have a whole chapter on colonial forest research. So, and one of the major arguments I've made in my PhD thesis is the fact that this is, in a very strong sense, in a continuity from colonial forest conservation. So you see, this different, uh, the same kinds of logic, the same kinds of um, ways of treating local people, um, mm -hmm. paternalizing, patronizing ways of treating local people, uh, the same idea that local people are the problem. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you have um, uh, the state stopping uh, local people from entering the forest, accessing the forest. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you then have international investors who are doing precisely that, they're clearing more forests than local people. So historically, you know, from colonial times, it's always been like that. Criminalizing uh, local people, criminalizing their livelihoods, mm -hmm. and then allowing capitalist interests to sort of grow bigger and all that. So of course, in the ways that the communities also see all of this, I mean, they embody the experience themselves. Many of these are stories told in the past like, from generations to generation. And in fact, the very presence of forests um, Forest reserves around them remind them of how those reserves were constituted in the first place. So it's always through the process of excluding local communities, which is again playing out all over again in Red Plus. Uh, Red Plus, which is supposed to be um, a way of voluntarily incentivizing conservation, is, is in fact is in force. And this is not just in the case of Nigeria. I mean, there have been many other countries where it has required the use of force to sort of secure red cross areas or guarantee that the same areas will be um, protected in the future. So there is a lot of continuity, a lot of resonance between um, between the colonial um, forest conservation, now, now colonial forest conservation treated communities, and now for, um, red cross um, currently treated community. And again, it's always the north against south. And here also, mm -hmm. it's not against south. If we the states, if they, if the post-colonial state is used as a go-between, uh, it's yeah. still the interest of um, the global north that is being pushed yeah. through the post-colonial state. So, yeah, so essentially that. There are other, other um, similarities I highlighted in my work, and we can talk a bit about that. Uh, Why don't we be able to read your paper? Which one? This, this one. This one is still under review. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure yet, but I, 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 we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. So questions, um, comments? Yes. Yeah, th thank you very much. I mean, thank you very much for the talk, which I found most illuminating, and I'll have to go away and read more about some of the concepts and, and that sort of thing. But I've worked a lot in Nigeria and I've worked in Cross River State. Okay. Now, my concern is always in a country like Nigeria, the governance. You know. And that can go right down to the individual, to, to the, the head of the local government area or the, or the state governor or, or the federal level. And I can't remember whether forestry is a, is a state level responsibility or a federal one. But essentially, um, th there seems to be an awful lot um, weighing on this red plus sort of bringing home the bacon mm. and, and delivering. I mean, it, the, your, I thought these were good quotes. Mm. But um, there is, there's been a problem ever since independence that, that 
government, the Nigerian authorities, have not delivered roads, safe water, schools, and health care. And so uh, that must skew the approach, surely, of the communities to <coughs> the, you know, the commodity that they see that they have, which is, which is hardwood, which they therefore want to trade. Mm. Um, and you, you, you're saying that uh, in Cross River State is um, is about fifty percent of Nigeria's remaining tropical forest, and I would be surprised where is where is the rest of it because I thought it was it was pretty well all gone. Um, there has been so much illegal logging, and I mean you know the story of Nigeria better than I do. You know people will be hand in hand. Uh, the so-called big men making sure that you know they can they can uh, they can make yeah earn, earn their naira, but the that's always at the price of, of the communities. Hmm. So I I I don't quite see where Red Plus comes in. Is this something, for example, which the federal government of Nigeria subscribes to wholeheartedly? Hmm. Ah, okay, and, yeah. And how how would we know this? You know, what are the well, the federal government subscribes. Okay, let's start with the last question. Uh, this is a national project. It started off in Cross River because that was where the environment summit was. That was where the conservationists were, many of them who brought in the idea of Red Cross in the first place. But before they could begin to approach the World Bank, the UN, for support and financial funding, they knew it was a national project. So they had to link up with the National um, Department of Forestry. And all that. So the National Department of Forestry is so to say, figure it kind of, and all they do is just uh, working on paper. And that's not only because this started in Cross River, it's also because in Nigeria, uh, the federal government does not have claim to land and forest. So the land and forest are owned or are um, held in trust for the people by state governments. So that the federal government couldn't have done anything on the ground anyway. So, all they did was just paperwork, and that's what they continue to do in Red Plus. And that's why Nigeria's form of Red Plus is a nested Red Plus, where implementation goes on both at the national level, um, policy and paperwork, but at the um, state level is where you have engagement with communities, where you have um, more interaction on the ground. So that said, uh, I think your point is the fact that Nigeria is a peculiar case, um, if I get what you're saying. But it's a peculiar case where where you are likely to have this sort of situation in almost any project that comes in, if that's what you insinuate. But my, my response to that would be that things are not as simple and straightforward as that. I mean, uh, uh, in fact, even in terms of how the state, the uh, Nigerian state, has fostered development, has um, embraced its own people, and in time, in looking at it in that way, uh, you won't have a very linear future. I mean, you've had you know, military times, you've had civilian times, mm -hmm. you've had times of economic boom uh, in the 1970s where infrastructure was built almost everywhere in the state. You've also had times of structural adjustment program where the World Bank and others came and told the states to sort of disengage in all kinds of projects and limit its impact and that pushed a lot of people into poverty. So it's always, always mixed and it's difficult to have a a linear picture. But what's also important to note is the sense in which this Nigeria experience, of course, uh, uh, has been shaped by context, uh, militarization in particular, um, and the form that it has taken Nigeria, it has taken Nigeria, has been shaped by the Nigerian context. But you also have very, very similar uh, narratives coming from other cases of Red Plus. From Kenya, for instance, uh, you have cases of similar cases of communities being disempowered and being uh, being um, displaced in Uganda. In, um, so you have cases uh, here and there of, of this sort of violence uh, related to red, um, the cases that sort of demonstrate the sense in which communities have been marginalized. And the fact that red plus benefit is not materializing, it's also universal, like um, Faye earlier said. I mean, the promised benefits either to communities or the huge finance promised to states are not happening. And, States are, on one hand, investing part of their own. So they are in Cross River, for instance, uh, before they started receiving funds from the from the World Bank and the UN, the state have been budgeting part of its own finance to sort of prepare for Red Plus. So you have investment from the states in this sort of projects that is not yielding anything. That's why the governor came back and said Red Plus is not yielding any any return on investment for you. 
So I think the, the picture is fairly more complex. Uh, some of these narratives you've seen in other cases of Red Cross. Uh, the Nigerian context, of, of course, structures how, how any project at all would, would, would play out. But what we're saying is there have been other projects in the past that haven't, this, that haven't been this, this terrible. Um, um, there have been interventions from, from the USAID, the FID, participatory community governance, all kinds of projects in the past that haven't been this, this really bad. So it, to my mind, it's on one hand a combination of all kinds of factors, some contextual, but also global factors. Um, the promises in Red Plus, the approach of Red itself, um, um, a totalizing approach in which um, rather than take Red Plus as one of the, um, one of the two tools for forest management, Red Plus has been taken as a, a, an overarching strategy for managing the entire forest and, and cross you. So and that's it, that's very problematic. And um, as long as the international partners and proponents do not weigh in on this sort of complexities and sort of denounce them and sort of make very strong statements, and in fact, if possible, uh, caution the state do all kinds of things to show that they are not in support of this. Because the, the violence and the militarization that is going on in Russia is constantly being shown to the World Bank, the UN, to tell them that we are protecting the forest for red. We are serious about it. We are doing it. And, and uh, so, so there is complicity from all kinds of actors, and not just the Nigerian states, the always bad states. So that's where I see. So would you then, is that what your view is globally? Are there any examples globally where there have been um, communities benefiting and their interests not being marginalized, or has it just been this top-down um, approach that's having similar results everywhere? Uh, Red Cross is difficult for me to see, to, to see where communities are getting the kind of benefits they have been promised or benefits that are commensurate with how much they are giving up in terms of livelihood access. There hasn't been a project that pays communities in commensurate, very commensurate, tangible ways for what they are losing from their loss. So, of course, in many other projects, it may not be, have been as severe as this. I mean, um, communities being barred from entering the forest at all, being criminalized, being um, taken to courts. So, it may not have been this severe in some other countries. I, to my knowledge, I don't know if they had those one where communities are being paid. Red Plus, not PES. So Red Plus are national projects. PES cases are different because they operate at smaller scales, all kind, different kinds of scales. So yeah. for PES, you might have commensurate to the world. But Red Plus, because it's national, it's always top down. It's, it involves um, going through the states. So yeah. you can't have Red Plus outside of the state. And that makes it I think you made a very important point about how you can figure Red Plus within our country because you may get one or two communities benefiting, and, and again, that's a qualified term because what do we mean by benefit? Mm. If you link it to development, is it about finance, is it about provision of some service over what period of time? Um, and, and, and what do you have to give to get that benefit? You know, what do you have to give up in terms of access to resources or um, have to take on uh, responsibilities like monitoring, reporting, you know, to the government, using technologies that are not really part of your culture? So the, what we mean by benefit is complex. Mm -hmm. But you, you were raising that point about the, com the conflict between communities because suddenly, there's this sense of, well, we could get something, still not really knowing what it is, but based on new promises. And, you know, there's antipathy between communities. And there's animosities which go way back and have got nothing to do with Red Plus, but it's an opportunity to bring them out. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are numerous examples, uh, you know, in. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, in uh, Bolivia, mm -hmm. in. Um, Peru, in Ecuador, in uh, Vietnam, you know, they're, they're nearly everywhere where the forest uh, agencies have taken on red 
as a strategic way to manage the forests, um, you, it's, it's had an impact which, um, which we're only starting to get more and more sort of information about because this is, you know, it's t the, the pilot projects and nested projects, they've only really started to kick in in the past two, three years. Mm -hmm. to be honest. Yeah, and, uh, and, and your point about legal, or the reconstitution regulation, mm -hmm ending up criminalizing activities which were previously fine, uh, this fits into another parallel narrative and discourse in international and regional forest law, which is on illegal trading of timber and uh, illegal harvesting of timber. Yeah. So we've got feeding into criminalization and, and transnational environmental crimes, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, and then we've got illegal carbon trading forest carbon trading, which is a, another one. <laughs> Problem that's carbon cardboard. Yeah, yeah, and conflict carbon, and all these things, you know. So we, you know. Yeah. So I wouldn't, yeah, I mean, you're talking to people that aren't proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> See, only the problem. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious about like the ways in which um, local people resist and articulate their resistance, and also how like, critical NGOs based in Nigeria articulate their resistance. Because my, um, I'm more familiar with some of the cases in Latin America. Um, and the way that I've heard them articulate it there is often that um, those who actually know, like those, those who, who know and who have and who will continue to manage forests are, of course, indigenous populations, right? And that not only is this um, about restricting community access and criminalizing livelihoods and, and policing um, you know, native land. It's also kind of productive in the sense of kind of kind of what I think what you were pointing out with you know the clearing of agricultural land, which is obviously one of the major drivers of, of deforestation, you know, is still is still permitted under this um, framework. So I don't know if is there a linkage, I guess, between the criminalization of livelihood and this kind of violence and also a kind of, you know, political ecology um, narrative, I guess, about you know about um, who who are the real stewards of the land, or who are the real stewards of the forest, and who. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, the, the, I think what one can always expect that in every situation. I mean, the, the very first basis in which communities would um, challenge projects that marginalize them would first be on the claims that. They own, they own these places, they've always managed it. And, and in fact, that's the basis on which critical NGOs are organizing communities to, to come around. Uh, those projects threaten your rights to the forest, your rights to manage it, your rights to enter it, access it, um, draw, draw um, livelihoods from, from the forest. So, so, in ways that NGOs are organizing communities, sort of narratives and, and um, and um, framings are very central, but they stand at the, at the very heart of NGO organizing. And all that. But I don't know if what you're also interested in the ways that communities themselves organize resistance. And yeah, I mean, that is what, like, yeah, I mean, of course, I'm actually curious a lot about a lot of things, but if you want to get into like the details of resistance and how it's articulated, I'm interested in that. But I guess what I find so particularly insidious about, about Red mm -hmm. and about these kinds of obviously neocolonial, very top down approaches is that they appropriate this idea that like we are the protectors, right? It's like suddenly um, the global market and international agencies and nation states have are the, are the ones that are you know have successfully appropriated this narrative that we are the protectors of the land. We are the ones who who show real interest, and it's these local people that are violating this interest, right? Uh, and so I guess what I'm saying is flipping that narrative on its head oh, okay. um, and saying no, actually you have no interest really, oh. and it's we're the ones who have always and who will continue. Uh, to, to protect yeah. our own livelihoods and protect our, our uh, you know our local environment. Yeah, I guess I mean, is there an element of that of like flipping that discourse? I get what you're saying. Now. But you see the, the ways that proponents relate to communities, they this narratives that they are, they are better managers of the of the forest. They never make it explicit. Okay. Because you can't go to communities and tell them we know how to be, manage your forest better, or we know how to manage your land. So in, in papers in discourses among proponents. They, of course, uh, they, they suggest this kind of narratives. But when they go to communities, they still tell communities, your land, it will be your forest. When the carbon comes, it will be your carbon, it will be your money, it will be all of that. But critical NGOs see beyond 
those um, said and, and begin to organize communities to reinstate their claims of forest. In fact, some are, some are taking Red Force as an opportunity to get their claims to land formalized. So, communal claims, of course, not, not uh, individual claims. So, in the way that they're saying to the state, if you're truly, if you're truly saying we go in the forest and you're coming to us for rights to carbon and all that, then give us something that will, in fact, formally shows that we own the forest. So, whereas the state has um, uh, um, recognized the facto claims of communities. So, communities are taking the opportunity, this opportunity to claim digital rights, so rights enshrined in law and all that. So there are elements of, of that uh, ongoing uh, in the ways that both the communities and the NGOs are critical for the health frame resistance towards towards women. I think that's a, you're right that they, mm -hmm. that they try to find line, and mm -hmm. I think this is particularly with conservation organisations who historically have been seen to be quite anti forest people. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they are the ones that destroy forests, so they, they kind of try to re, refashion themselves as okay, communities are part of the solution, mm -hmm. but they must have, they must use these tools that we have to help them show that they're managing the forest. So all the, the, the whole thing of community-based forest uh, monitoring programs and things like this, is, and they, so they are brought into the process. You know. So you're either in with this right. or you're not. And I think it, it, uh, and it sets up that dichotomy where communities, if they say no, then they're seen to be against trying to contribute to this global solution and mm -hmm. this is I think when you were saying the link is why this keeps going is because mm -hmm. it, it's desperately needed. Mm -hmm. Forests are constitute around eighteen to twenty percent emission emission global greenhouse gas emissions. So something needs to happen to stop yeah. deforestation. Mm -hmm. The main main drivers of deforestation, as you say, are agricultural land conversion mm -hmm. or in industrial uh, cash crops and fire <coughs> Yeah. Mm. So, so it's that, it's that, yeah, there's a huge PR exercise goes on, and yeah. I think your, your point about the, you know, in your theoretical sections mm. about the way in which these things are uh, aggregated and, mm. you know, the languages that they yeah. use. And yeah. Explicit yeah. flourishing, always inclusive narratives, um, uh, optimistic narratives, participatory narratives, always friendly in those ways. And even benefit sharing is just. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. nobody knows what it means. <laughs> yeah, actually, with that question, like, what benefits um, were promised or are expected to be seen, uh, specifically in Costa Rica, in the Costa Rica community? Okay, in communities. Okay, can I see those statements? So, as people were telling me those statements off there, part of what they told me was. In 2009, uh, the first uh, Red Plus mission that came to them told them that by 2013, they said first quarter, by the way, that's specific. They told them the year, told them first quarter of 2013, they all should expect to be millionaires. And those were the words that the communities used, that they, were, they would get so much money that each one of them would be millionaires. And many of the communities believed that. So I was told this in the Cuesta community, I was told this in, in the Kuri community. And that's, that's precisely why communities feel these promises have not been realized, because they were actually told the deadline. So if we're not told when to expect it, it's easy to continue to postpone it. But communities were given specific deadlines like that, they were told they, were, they received so much money. That. So they were promised money. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't told uh, alternative livelihoods and all that because they were told the carbon will be sold for money. So they were told by 2013, you, know, you will, your forest will be then generating carbon credits, which will be sold on the international markets that will generate so much money for each one of you to share. Yeah. So those were the things that communities were told. So, so they were told those uh, specifically, and of course, communities began to also think of what to do with this sort of money. And that's where they began to say, ah, okay, we can then send our children to school, 
that can make ball hole in our communities if we have this much money, and that's why the, um, this, this kind of um, statements are also in addition to that. But what they were told um, was that. So, but why many in the community, especially those um, those who are domiciled communities, believe this? I mean, they also had members of the community who who are more than that, who walk in cities, who scrutinize the schemes more critically. And who know that, in fact, there was a time that one of the community-based organizations um, in Ikuri, the second day, another community besides the Ikuri side, they also carried out an evaluation of their own. So what happened was, as part of the piloting for, for Red Cross carbon estimation, so the, the proponents of Red Cross, Red Cross implementers, selected two to three communities where they carried out um, exercises, carbon measurement exercises on the ground. So what they do was basically measuring three volumes and then using all kinds of calculations to convert that to carbon equivalent. Yeah, and they involved some of these community members in, in, in that. So one of the actors in the community organization went ahead and did a calculation, extrapolated from that one plot for all their forests, and they looked at how much they will actually get for one for in one year for carbon increments in their forest, taking account of the fact that their forest, as they claim, has been around for two thousand years. So, so the community is claiming that their forest their forests have been around for two thousand years. So that whatever carbon they measuring in it at the time they were doing the measurement had accumulated for two thousand years. So they divided the amount of carbon by two thousand years, looked at how much they have in one year, and see how very tiny. The money that will actually come to them by the price of carbon um, in the international market actually comes. So, so essentially, what I'm saying is, while on one hand, many community members believe that they will be truly the millionaires, on the other hand, um, if, um, those who are more learned in the communities are engaging more critically and showing that, in fact, going by um, the cost of the, the price of carbon in the international market and how much it takes to accumulate significant carbon in their trees in their forests. Yeah, the amount that will come to them will be so insignificant, so meager. So some of them are also critiquing Red Cross on that basis. You said that um, organization actions are part of the government apparatus um, for creating a market regime. Yeah. While well, the Red Plus actually provides the vision for that um, carbon market exchanges, what actions are the government actually taking to promote any action in the cross border plan? Yeah, but you see, the, the organizing actions are all kinds of visions of one kind, but also practices and actions of the other. So each one of these, if, if stabilizing stabilization is one one form, of, one category of action, I think it involves all kinds of little little actions on, on their own. So from uh, um, um, so payments, for instance, payments, paying carbon royalties instead of royalty. Actions that limit implementation on one hand, but also reiterating promises and narratives. These are actions. I mean, they are not just visions that are written in paper. These are things that the states and Red Cross implementers and uh, proponents of Red Cross do on a regular basis. Protecting the forest is is also an action. It's an everyday action. It's not just a vision written in paper. Does that answer some of what you're asking? So many of those things are actually actions. This is the only one that is vision in there. So reforming institutions are actions. They've changed the law in 2010, and they are changing constitution of, of um, government institutions. So it's only uh, this vision that captures the aims documented in the paper, but also the aims as they speak about it. Almost every other thing are actions. So all of them, all this, including the vision itself, everything comes under on the, on the organizing action. So all of them, problematization, vision, institution. Uh, categorize all of these as different elements of the organizing actions. So organizing action is not necessarily um, doing. It's doing on one hand, but it's also speaking. Speaking is also action, you know, um, reiterating narratives and all that. But does that answer your, your question? Yeah. Okay. But what is the stabilization? What? So these are activities that keep this assemblage from falling apart. Mm -hmm. Because of the complex and the contradiction and the tension, mm -hmm. so you expect that project of this nature 
don't go very far. Mm -hmm. But because implementers are able to stabilize this, this project and some of the activities or some of the things they do to stabilize it are repeating the promises and the optimistic narratives that distract people away from the tension. So they go to communities and continue to tell them about the good things that will come, money that will come from red laws. They continue to tell the governor, who is actually the one putting his weight behind all of this, continue to tell him that just wait a little bit. Uh, this finance is coming from the World Bank, that is coming from the UN. He also is waiting patiently to just see how much money comes from all of that. So those are, those are of narratives, but also limiting implementation. Because to, to spread this kind of project all over Nigeria will cause chaos very quickly. So they limit it as much as possible. To, so from the national, they limit it to cross river. Even within cross river, they limit it to cluster communities. And then cluster communities, they pick just one or two communities within those clusters. But also, so because they realize that the project is not really feasible um, yeah. at that scale, you know, there's pilots within pilots, within pilots. Like. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, so essentially, that there are all kinds of strategies, and here they have. I have a, a whole chapter on creating subjectivities mm -hmm. among communities using this kind of narratives, but also using carbon loyalty payment that I mentioned earlier. So looking at communities that operate and then giving them money and saying, this is loyalty. This will replace a formal, formal timber loyalty that communities used to receive based on the amount of forest they have and how much timber is being taken from their forest. That determined loyalty, but now it's carbon loyalty. So those are deliberate strategies. So that communities conserve and then they're given money in yeah. Exchange yeah. For so not just for conservation. So you might be conserving, but you are critical. You are, for instance, taking the the government to court over the violence of the task force. You are mm -hmm. not cooperating with that. So their definition of cooperation is subjective to them. They determine it. It's not written up to anyone. Right. So it's not just about the outcome, but the process of yeah. The cooperation. Yeah. The process of cooperation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also, I'm not sure. Maybe I just missed the part where you were talking about this, but I'm just curious. How it is that these international markets that were supposedly so promising have been materialized? Like, what, what is the state of the international carbon market at the moment, and how it, how is it that it's not um, giving the kind of returns that were forecasted? The structure for that is complex. Uh, part of it is because part of it is okay. There are, there are all different kinds of elements that constitute that are brought into the international carbon market. So there, there are carbon cap and trade projects. Mm -hmm. So these are projects, for instance, in California, where people are given permits to emit, to permits to determine how much emission they could do in a year. So if you're able to emit lower than your permits, then you sell what is left of your permits to someone else who wanted to emit more than their own permits. So that's cap and trade. That's capping how much people can emit, and then people can trade whatever balance or, or deficit they are. So those sort of projects tend to work fairly smoothly because they are well defined within particular industries. The actors are known and listed there, and they are carried out in developed countries. In California, for instance, I don't know which other country does cap and trade. So those ones tend to work fairly well. Um, anyway, well, not necessarily in terms of reducing, not not in terms of reducing emission, but there are exchanges going on, and people make money from that. But sort of markets that are linked to projects like Red Cross, it will be difficult for them, for them to take off, I mean, because of this kind of complexities. Because on the ground, these things aren't working. I mean, it's difficult to to, to exclude people and then to. Uh, use the military to exclude them and then expect them to stay quiet. You know, this kind of complexity limits how much this sort of project can translate into global climate exchange. But there, are, there are many, most of the um, carbon market exchange that that, that are ongoing. I would call them successful on the basis of reducing emission, but successful on the basis of actual transactions are going on. They are limited to the global global north except the ones that are linked to payment for ecosystem services, which are often very small, discrete projects. Maybe with one tiny community somewhere where one uh, company comes and says, OK, if you give your forest for five years, I'll, I'll give you this money. The, the, the company is known, the communities are known, they can interact. And, and that's often a state uh, project, right? The state uh, pays for these ecosystem services. 
Yeah, so that's the argument that in many of these cases, the state pays, or in many of these, in some of these cases, some of this money comes through the states to communities. But there are cases where companies and, and corporations actually pay directly to communities. But these are, again, payment, yeah, small scale kind of projects um, that generate emission savings and all of that. But the challenge, I think, with carbon trading, sorry? Yeah, by all means. But I was, I was going to say this last thing that the, the part of the major challenge has been the price of carbon itself, which is, I think, there's just a complexity around that. The fact that the price keeps falling since so the first day that they've managed to determine. I don't know how they determine the price of carbon in the international market, but the price has kept falling, which means that there's no, there's no incentive to look forward to that market because the price of carbon anyway is, is much lower than what you get from timber or. or so for yeah, I mean, Red Plus was part of the International Climate Change Convention. It's included in the Paris Agreement. It's been negotiated mm -hmm. for uh, the past next uh, 10 years. And there is no actual market within that system as yet. Right? Mm -hmm. So we've got the Paris Agreement entered into force, but we haven't got a global market for forest carbon trading. And there's no global market for carbon trading. There's, um, there's different national and regional systems. There's some agreement for fungible trading, so they have to be equivalent the types of certificates you're trading. And uh, land use, it's known as land use, land use change in forestry, uh, carbon certificates are still not seen as equivalent and, and trustworthy enough to be, marketable. To, to be to trade with a just a regular carbon trading, like say for emission reductions from a coal fire plant, which you can calculate quite easily. It's harder to calculate emission reductions from um, up, so from so. change in forest activity mm -hmm. like, accurately. There's queries about margins of error between like 30 to 70, 80 percent, depending on the type of forest, depending on the type of tree, depending on the type of land. You know, just so, so there's all the complexities around the marketization and the fungibility in the trading, which still exists. Right? So that's, for anybody that's even pro the whole thing, that is still problematic, you know, in terms of it being uh, the risk element of the investment, et cetera, et cetera, without all the risk side of dealing with community conflict, et cetera, et cetera. So, they're trying to do it and they've incorporated, I was going to ask you about safeguards and how safeguards oh. fit into stabilisation, like safe, safeguards were it. Safeguards? Safeguards, we're talking yeah. about safeguards, but also payments by results and whether carbon loyalty is a kind of payment by result. I mean, there's not much of a result, but it's a kind of, yeah. Yeah, safeguards are standard uh, principles. Um, and requirements outlined by um, major Red Plus um, partners. So the World Bank, for instance, has its own standard safeguarding principles. Those are principles that ensure that uh, projects do not uh, affect communities negatively and do not have negative environmental impact. So those are what safeguards are meant to, to achieve. One of them is FPIC, free power and informed consent. So it's this principle that communities have to know about this project before and they have to agree to do it, they have to. So these are standard measures put in place by these international agencies. And but of course, like bringing the military in is completely compliant right, with completely, that. Somehow. Yeah, opposite okay. of that. And that's the challenge with, with some and of these. It's included in the, the, the UN FCCC has included safeguards as part of the guidance for developing Red Plus mm -hmm. within a national framework. Mm -hmm. And, that, you know, like you said, uh, you know, the free prior informed consent, which is within the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Peoples, uh, is supposed to honor human rights obligations, mm -hmm. you know. And the ILO. And yeah, yeah. It just seems a little bit absurd to me that, you know, you would set, a, set into place all of these processes to really shift forest governance, but then not really actually operationalize markets. Mm. Um. Mm. Markets are, I think, uh, they, are, they are tougher to, to, to um, they don't just come from thin here. I mean, 
the young, it, they are difficult to construct, yeah, like to honestly, yeah. than to just make a uh, number of rules and say people follow it. Even these rules, these safeguards, the fact that these things could be happening in Nigeria means that these safeguards are safeguards on paper. Implementing them is a different case entirely. The FP, for instance, the, the proponent just went to communities and told them, we are doing FP, they are come and write your names and got uh, members at a particular meeting to write their names, maybe with their signature in front, so they will go present that to UNF. You see, the communities have agreed to do it, whereas communities didn't know precisely what they were doing with um, those documents and all that. So it's, uh, it's one case putting in place to say, yeah, some other place um, implementing that. It goes back to what the gentleman said about government. Um, mm -hmm. In many uh, tropical forest countries, uh, government is a real challenge if you're talking about establishing the processes, not just the substantive objective, but the processes to realize that you know, mm -hmm. um, procedural change, um, etc. And like you say, you just yeah, we did that, we did yeah, that. It's a good, it's a good and, and also communities are very receptive to the opportunity. You know, these are often very poor and desperate and vulnerable people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, that's another aspect. So if you like to talk uh, Red Plus, who was pushing it? How, how come it ended up in the, in the final the, uh, communique or whatever? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it sounds as though it's theoretically interesting but untested and it seems pretty irresponsible yeah. you know in 2005 uh, these ideas were actually championed by developing countries brazil yeah. so uh, costa rica countries. Of the coalition of yeah right um and it was within the kyoto protocol mm -hmm. You have all known as flexibility mechanisms uh, to realise emission reduction targets. <laughs> 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 and, and one of those was known as the clean development mechanism. Right. And that was, you could, as a developing country, you could have projects in your country that led to emission reduction, and you could trade the value yeah. of those emission reductions with countries that had legal obligations to reduce their emissions. So they could take those emission reductions, carry on their pollution, buy those emission reductions which were cheaper to achieve, and then uh, use them. Yeah. So that forests weren't included in that, and obviously countries that had high uh, forest density that were less industrial, like so China was doing, China and India were the most from the clean development method, saw so this as an opportunity to, to be part of this booming market and that's why it was kind of put forward yeah. you know, it was seen as the the equivalent of the clean development mechanism for forest mm. countries mm. you know they could cash in on this this market mm. and that and that was why it's seen as a huge potential market everyone thought it was going to be to start with uh, and, and then all the complexity kicked in you know, because forests are complicated there's a whole international forest regime with different obligations with different, different, different. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a very complicated project. Forest governance is complicated on its own. Mm -hmm. Climate governance is complicated on its own. Imagine that. Now bring this two together. The saddest thing was, um, Lord Stern, who published his economics book about climate change, said that um, the only way to get the emission reductions to the target that they wanted to get was to have forest it would be uh, we would be able to do it quickly and uh, huge, quick and efficient. efficient yeah. uh, and somebody turned around and said, "Well, you just have no idea about forests and forest governance and forest peoples and all the problems." You know? And that was well, that's why we're where we are now. Who is that? It's Lord Stern in 2007 in the it's climate change. He's actually just brought out a new book. Um, Stern. Yeah, yeah. 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 They call it Stern Review. Stern Review, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stern, yeah, Speaking of um, forest governance, what was the kind of I mean, community forest rights or right, property rights that existed uh, before that came along in, in Trust of Yeah, thank you very much. 
what sort of community property right exists there um, before red came along? Yeah. Um, so, in Nigeria, uh, like I said earlier, the state has like the, the dual uh, rights to land. So there is this Land Use Act of 1990, which vested all land in the state government, all land in the state government, uh, to audit and trust for the people. So whenever the state claims to be doing anything in public interest, that's the right to take over any land for. Uh, including community land. Though there is a clause within this law uh, that recognizes customary land rights. But even that land right is subject to the dictates of, of the state government. So, mm -hmm. so while the communities can challenge other um, claimants to the land, uh, can use that law to challenge other claimants, it's difficult for them to use it to challenge the state because the state would then tell them they're doing this in the general public interest which supersedes customary um, recognition. So that at any point in time, uh, community land or any kind of land for is potentially a near the United States um, for general ultimate public good. So that's, that's a recognized, well of course communities are one this, they own this land. This loss came about first in 1978, then 1990. Prior to this time, communities owned the land and they've always used the land. But this loss came and then transfer rights to the states. And, mm -hmm. you know. But it's not as if red, has, red hasn't changed these things on paper. What it has done is basically reinforced state control of land through the use of state force um, military to chase out communities, even of community forests. Mm -hmm. so, Yeah, thank, thank you, you very yeah. much. <laughs> thank you very much for coming. So next week we'll be meeting here again. Uh, we'll be having the next in the series where Dr. Maria will be speaking about political ecology of water. Is in Palestine. Uh, of virtual water. Of virtual water, which is very important. For water. <laughs> yeah. So please do join us again next week. Thank you very much for coming.